Well, hello and welcome to the show, folks. Exile Minds podcast, Liam Martin, episode number seven today. We've got a lovely day today. And um, as promised, we've got uh, an episode today, which is sort of a bit of a follow on from the last episode. It kind of, this, the two things do kind of segue in together a little bit. So to this week's ep- this, uh, this episode, uh, episode number seven, is going to be about Agatha or Agatha. That's the kingdom inside the earth. Okay, so in this episode, we're going to take a, a, a deep dive or a dig down into the controversial topic of the hollow earth. We'll be taking a look at the folklore and uh, seek to understand if, 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 any, if there's any scientific evidence that could possibly support this. And could there be a great city or cities beneath our feet? Okay, it's basically the question I want to ask today and then see what else comes up along the way. So that's what we're going to explore today. And I say it, it segues into the previous episode, number six. That was an episode on a, looking at um, monster myths. Okay, looking at some of these monsters. So we'll see how that sort of can possibly tie in. And then uh, yeah, we'll just go for it and see what's what. Okay, so to start with, the idea is that, say, so there's this world that, you know, is potentially reachable. Was a sort of lost world that we don't really know about, and it's uh, known as a uh, uh, Shambhala or Agatha or Agatha. Okay, and it's supposed to be like a kind of hidden part of the earth, which many cultures have referred to, and it's been in a lot of uh, pop culture stuff as well. In, like in recent Marvel movies, based on the you know Marvel comics, Doctor Strange. Okay, that's got that kind of you know that hollow earthy stuff going on, as in. It goes through a traumatic experience and finds this strange land, this other place. It's mythical, you know, to me, it's kind of a bit magical place. And the same with uh, DC Comics. We've got um, the Iron Fist. Danny ran the Iron Fist as a traumatic experience. Plane crashed in the mountains as a kid, ends up at some inaccessible place where there's this city, learns this amazing kung fu. And it's only every now and again where it's passable, where it can get through the mountains. Okay, so the mountains are impassable, but every now and again, for some weird reason, they are. You know, and that's kind of the story of Iron Fist, that he ends up becoming this super kung fu master, gets the power, but then suddenly an opportunity. Not long after he's got, he's become the best, greatest kung fu power guy. He's got the chief fist power of a dragon, whatever. He then gets the opportunity to leave for the first time, so tries to go back home, you know, and, and you know, this hidden land stuff. And of course, we've got it in the classic um, movie Land of the Lost, you know, a reference to unexplored wondrous parts of the world. And I think they, I think in Land of the Lost, they went in through a, a submarine. And I think they might have been trying to escape Germans or something. They went in a submarine into some cabins and popped up somewhere and it was all like dinosaurs and stuff. I'm pretty sure that's the premise of Land of the Lost. So, I mean, yeah, it's popped up in uh, pop culture, this idea that there's lost worlds that we just perhaps, you know, haven't reached unaware of, okay? And th- for me, I think it first starts in pop culture, this, this idea with, you know, journey to the centre of the earth. Jules Verne, you know, famed uh, sci-fi writer from, from way back in the day. Uh, Journey to the Centre of the Earth, first published French, 1864. And then uh, it took another 10 years before it was uh, translated in English. So, you know, got the mid, mid to late 19th century, the idea of going to the centre of the earth and the plot of that the book and, you know, the films. Is that there's a Professor Otto Lidenbrock. Yeah, it shows you him at the beginning of the film, he's like dashing home. And he wants to pursue this interest. He's got his new antique that he's bought. And it's an original runic manuscript of an Icelandic saga. Okay, so this is a, supposed to have been a, written by somebody called Snor Stulensen. Okay, and, it, and it's, it's chronicles this, uh, it's a chronicles of a Norwegian king who ruled over Iceland. Okay, and Linda Brock was his nephew Axel, finds a coded written note in runic script. And along is the name of a 16th century Icelandic alchemist. Okay. So um, Lindenbrock's translated a paragraph in the 16th century note written by the alchemist. 
okay, so you've got to see his, his so he's got his, he's got his um, manuscript, you know, he's reading it, and it's basically telling of um, that it's it's in a, what they, they call some kind of bastardized Latin and tried to decipher this message, but in this message that this guy's got, this professor's got, it's like, well, it says, go down into the crater, a snilefellas yorgul, which um, it says there's a there's a shadow that caresses just before the the calendars of july so in the calendar time of july i go to this certain place and the shadow oh dear in traveler you'll make it to the center of the earth i have done so you know so it, it sends him on this this mission to try and find this certain place in iceland at a certain time of year where they're going to try and find an entrance inside the earth you know? so and that's like let's say it's nearly a century and a half old idea in pop culture but I think, that, well, I know that the idea of that could exist deep inside the Earth, this life that's kind of thriving in another place, I mean, it dates back to way further than the, the mid-19th century. It, go, it goes back much, much f further into history, as we'll find out. But like I say, in, a, in more recent times, again, referencing back to um, the first very f f first episode of uh, Exile Minds podcast, we uh, talked about Antarctica. Okay, and it, with uh, we we'll give a honourable mention to uh, an admiral, admiral Bird of the U.S. Navy. Okay, and in that in that first episode, he's come, he comes up again because it's alleged. Because what well, I mean, there was some funky stuff that he had to deal with. At the end of the Second World War, which might get into a bit later, it's, you know, it's covered in the first episode of uh, Exile Minds podcast. It was Antarctica, strange life beneath the ice, and you know some potential ancient or alien structures under the poles and whatnot. And, and Admiral Byrd was a key figure towards the end of the Second World War. I suppose that's some big vibe. But anyway, Admiral Byrd comes up here because there's alleged the <laughs> kind of secret diary that he wrote. And it was it was kind of involved in some. It was right up there. It's the youngest ever admiral. So, you know. Anyway, so Rear Admiral Bird, he's supposed to have this uh, secret diary, and this secret diary um, alleged that because the well, the, he, he was an intrepid explorer. He wasn't just a navy admiral. It was a it was an intrepid explorer, a real hero. And he was an aviator as well, and he, used to, he was the first guy to, I think, fly over both poles. I think officially in history, I think he's the first guy to do it. To actually be in an aeroplane and physically fly over the North Pole and the South Pole. Okay. So bear that in mind, he's, the, I think, I'm pretty, well, yeah, as far as I'm aware, he's the first person to be able to claim that he's done that. That a person's flew a plane over both the North and South Pole. All right. So let's bear that in mind. I just drop something there, but anyway, yeah. So Admiral Bird got this uh, secret diary then, supposedly, and uh, people have looked over it. And, uh, and it is true to say that, as we found in that in that first episode, the airlines of today they are they are redirected away from flying over the poles. That is true to say. So, safe safety reasons or whatever instruments or whatever. But so, I mean, I can't confirm the authenticity of this diary myself but it does raise some inter interesting questions okay considering as we say we discussed in the very first episode of exile minds podcast and as you you may have heard it's concerning the ufo whole ufo stuff and so there's supposed to have been a, a treaty to the grady treaty that was signed with aliens and whatnot okay so admiral birds had some sort of dealings with him because he was sent down in a flotilla to go and you know get the very last nazi base supposed to be hiding out in Antarctica and got their ass kicked. They did get their ass kicked, that is true. In history, they did. We say, well, how, but how it happened, not really, it's hard to believe, you know. But anyway, so this diary says that um, <laughs> well, basically, I mean, it, it did on TV, live on national telly, I probably did say, you know, that there's an area uh, as big as North America, that's always free from ice, warm, good climate. It's going to be really an important place for the world in terms of you know the species going into the future. And uh, his diary, with other witnesses, he, t he tells of entering into a interior of the Earth, 
according to these secret diaries. And that, <laughs> I mean, the remote viewers remote viewed this battle at the end of the Second World War, where there were you know, UFOs and stuff and the Nazi base and, and whatever, you know, and big underground, massive, giant caverns underground or giant rooms that have been made, massive, with a city down there and stuff. But there, there could be, you know, building bases or finding giant cavern kind of stuff. You know, that's one thing. But Admiral Birdie was talking about, according to these diaries, travelling into some kind of entrance where he managed to fly a total of uh, 1,700 miles. And he was going, basically, I think he's flew in so far and then, you know, come back because of his fuel. But they're saying he was flying over, for, so it's for hundreds and hundreds of miles, he's flying over lakes, mountains, rivers, green vegetation, seeing animal life, tales of seeing monstrous animals as in resembling mammoth of antiquity you know the old the old mammoth prehistoric creatures and when he's saying monstrous i think he's talking of like immense size and then basically he eventually uh finds you know cities that are thriving thriving civilizations his plane was greeted by flying machines and a type of which he'd not seen before and supposedly they ex es escorted him you know to me um an emissary from Agatha, and after resting, it, it said that like it, it, him and his crew were taken to meet like this ruler. So I suppose his king type figure, whatever. I didn't really say. Um, is it? Well, it is. It's, we'll get into it. It's like it's like this king. It's like it's supposed to be this like ruler of the world, right? And he's told him that uh, they've been allowed to enter like this main city. Uh, because of his high moral and ethical character okay and they went on to say ever since that the united states had dropped atomic bombs on uh, hiroshima and nagasaki they've been very concerned about their own safety and survival and they decided that the time it was time to make greater contact with the outer world outside world to make sure that it wouldn't destroy the planet and thus take their civilization out with it you know so but the thing is i mean this this thing uh, it says, I mean, they're saying that, and they're saying that they had allowed it, allowed him in for just for this reason, just so he can make he can be like in them area, I suppose, make contact with him because they trust this guy, saying so someone that's trusted. And if this really did happen, it's saying this happened in 1947. Well, if that did happen in 1947, that's the same year that Roswell happened, and we're testing our new high-powered radar stuff. You know, end of the Second World War, we're getting radar coming into play, right? And we're testing these new power power ones, and it's been speculated that this could have affected UFOs and maybe brought them down. But if they're coming from Spain, uh, space, you think, well, I can you have the technology to get across the galaxy, the vast distances, and yet come to Earth, suddenly we can just get you down with radar dish. But then when you think about maybe they're not, tra maybe the, these craft haven't had to travel from space and all across space. Maybe they've only had to travel from just a really far distance on the planet you know maybe you just need a lot of just need to be able to travel long distances do you know what i'm saying so maybe they're from earth not from space so maybe that's what roswell is and that stuff you know and if they're saying 1947 well, yeah because we dropped nuclear weapons that would make sense if someone else living here didn't know about us and we start that we didn't know about them and we start exploding nuclear bombs and it does make sense and some people have also speculated that the Tunguska event, if you look that up, uh, in Siberia, there's a massive, like, kind of uh, explosion, maybe an asteroid exploded above the ground or big something meteor hit, but then they can't find a big, massive rock. Asteroid, you know. And some people speculate that might have been, an, you know, another civilization, just kind of testing something out to see if it would affect them from a sort of another dimension that's close to ours kind of thing. But, you know, this sounds like all crazy talk. I know, it, I know it sounds nuts, but you've got to consider these things and then go where the evidence takes you, where the information goes and see how much of it you can kind of prove and stuff and how it kind of fits together. And so I will say, if, if the Roswell stuff happens in 1947, you know, maybe, you know, and the same thing just after the Second World War, done the nuclear explosions, you've got... Um, Admiral Byrd supposedly flew, flew into this hollow earth entrance met these people you know it would it does track that they would you know want to have so who can they trust sort of thing and he's an intrepid explorer 
a US Navy Admiral, and he was the guy leading the flotilla to take out that last Nazi base that got their ass kicked, apparently, by UFOs. So perhaps, you know, I've seen him in action and sort of thing. So, I don't know. And he's, you know, battle-hardened and fresh from having met some UFOs and found out some crazy stuff about the world, you know. And he did go on national telly and talk about, you know, the massive areas free from ice and all this exploration they're going to have to be doing in these new lands. And that was on national telly, you know, Chronoscope, which I mentioned uh, episode one. So, and then uh, also as well, in a book uh, called The Hollow Earth by Raymond Bernard, he tells of a man who confirms Admiral Byrd's story. He was a doctor, um, Nephi Cotton, a doctor in Los Angeles, says one of his patients... Um, a report a man of Nordic descent told him this following story. Okay, it says he lives. His man lives in Norway in the Arctic Circle. He and his friend decided to decided to travel as far no, into the North Country as they could one time. So they get the supplies together, go off in a fishing boat. It says at the end of one month, he would travel far into the North beyond the pole and into a strange new country where we were most astonished of the weather there. It was warm and at night, it was almost too warm to sleep. Then we saw something strange that we were both astonished by this too, ahead of the warm open seas, what looked like a great mountain into the mountain at a certain point. That ocean seemed to be emptying. So it was like, you know, there seems to be an entrance into a mountain almost. So mystified, they continue in the direction and found themselves sailing uh, into a vast canyon. Okay, so the, what looks like a mountain, they sailed into it. it looks like so it makes it look like the sea's coming out into out of it, stuff flowing out into the sea. Okay, so they go find this um, cavern, these you know huge canyons, vast canyons, and sail into it and seem to be sailing into the interior of the earth as they keep sailing. So what it says surprised us, it seemed to be a, sh uh, a sun shining inside the earth. All right, that's in, in, that's in the, the, the book, a book called The Hollow Earth, okay, by uh, Raymond Bernard. Say so all the links in this description as always. Okay, now the word Agatha has got a Buddhist origin, okay, and it, you know, people are well into Buddhism, you know, definitely believe in this place being real. The Buddhists really believe it. You know, and it refers to a subterranean world or an empire whose um, existence, as I say, um, is believed by Buddhists, and they believe this subterranean world has millions of inhabitants and many, many cities. Uh, and all they're all under the supreme dominion of um, of this subterranean capital, Shambhal, all right, or Shambhala. Okay, which is the Wi-Fi code that Doctor Strange gets given. When he goes to that strange place, they give him this thing. It says Shambhala. It says, "What is this my mantra?" You know, they're like, no, it's the Wi-Fi code. We're not savages, sort of thing. It's a little joke in the film. You know, Shambhala. That's the, that's the third place. So, I say it's supposed to be this king there, all right? And it says um, that Shambhal, where dwells the supreme ruler of this empire, is known in the Orient as the king of the world, all right? And it is believed that. They give orders to the Dalai Lama of Tibet, who is supposed to be like the the surface terrestrial representative of the King of the Earth inside. His messages are being transmitted supposedly through certain secret tunnels connected in the subterranean world to Tibet. Okay, to make the long story short, Admiral Byrd and his crew do that, do the visit, meet the people. The plane gets led back to sort of the way to get out. You know, the lives changed, and in a supposedly in January 1956, Admiral Byrd led another expedition to, you know, check it out again. And the crew managed to penetrate 2,300 miles into the centre of the Earth again. So it got a bit further, a few hundred miles further this time. You know, and he said that Admiral Byrd, according to these, maybe, maybe not, you know, secret diaries, said this: uh, the North and South Pole are two of many openings into the centre of the Earth. So, you know, so Jules Verne stuff, of course, you got that, but Admiral Byrd is saying that the, the, the inner earth has got a sun too, like the same as this Norwegian guy who's, you know, the doctor said has, you know, has gone in his sun, all right, and went into this mountain, what looked like a mountain, big vast canyon, okay. 
But Admiral Byrd's theory, according to these uh, diaries, saying that it's thinking that the Earth at the poles is a uh, is convex instead of uh, instead of concave. Just thought, is that that sounds like the wrong way around, sort of thing? But no. So I, I don't know how that description works. So I think that switched the wrong way around. Maybe the writer of this bit. I don't know, but. Yes, Admiral Burns theory is that the poles are convex rather than concave. But concave will be bending in. I don't know, I don't know what that is. But yeah, ships and planes can actually fly through it right in. So I think what it means there is that it should be con concave, should be bending in, going in like a cave, like a hole. You know, so I mean, yeah, we'll, um, we'll get a, an image up of this. It'll give a bit of a better description for those that are um, looking because it is a bit of a weird thing to try to conceptualize so i just uh, do a quick uh, share screen on this so i mean i'll try and zoom in a bit it's almost i think if you think of it as like a conveyor belt you know it's like you go along the surface along one and then it kind of like go around the corner and go back on the underside and then go around the corner again so think of it a bit like that I think that's what they're talking like, it's concave, like goes in, I think that's what it's meaning, but yeah. So you can look look up the image and stuff, but yeah, the city of Shambhala is the capital of this Agharta place. And, you know, <laughs> it's crazy, crazy stuff, man. I reckon you can fly ships and, uh, sorry, fly ships, I suppose good if you've got flying ships, but yeah, sail ships and fly aeroplanes straight into the north and south, and there's a few other entrances, you know. It's saying here, you know, it's a map actually, it says uh, there's one at uh, Mount Pompeii in Italy, there's uh, one at uh, Pyramid of Giza, one there, so I don't know. It says it's one in the Darrow Caves, there's one under the ocean, there's a, I don't know man, it's just, it says the centre of gravity is uh, 400 miles down, so it's like the Earth's crust, let's say the Earth's crust is 800 miles thick sort of what they're saying and after 400 miles the gravity kind of flips and so the interior of the earth you know kind of walk in what would be upside down to us sort of thing but then the into then the sky then i suppose is going to be your sky would be all the other continents all around the world <laughs> if you can see that far the atmosphere i don't know so your sky would be all land masses It'd be crazy to look at with like a sun floating in the middle. Can you imagine that? Just nuts, you know? But yeah, that's what we got. So, I mean, that's what this, that's what these things are saying, but that's what the Norwegian sailor guy says. Or, you know, so, I mean, the idea of a secret tunnel, of course, that's always a quite enticing, mysterious thing. And it brings to mind, you know, the rumors of secret tunnels all over the world. You know, these things do exist. And like I say, in the, the context of the first episode with the Nazi bases, there's all that, um, they had the underwater submarines, you know, getting pictures of stuff anyway. Um, you've got uh, the Nazi U-boats and stuff um, navigating. Um, they've got maps, uh, you know, sort of navigating through the ice. You know, they've got, they've got that stuff. That's that was the premise. Like I say, it was the, the premise of um, Land of the Lost, you know? So you've got this submarine that's had to for whatever reason you know navigate its way through and end up pop out somewhere somewhere else so it's it's something to consider and like i say according to the remote viewers which have been really really accurate the fire sightings do the, the you know the nazi base stuff in the mountain linking into a massive massive gigantic cabins systems that seem to have a city that seems to be their city like a regular like our kind of city down there but then some completely different kind of construction type different type of architecture in another one you know speculating oh, there might be aliens and, and and such you know so it's like well what's maybe it's people living un under there you know so i mean it's claimed that um that the the, the editor there's a uh, there's a it used to be a magazine from the 50s, I think 50, 50s till the early to mid 80s, there was this magazine called uh, Flying Saucer Magazine. And the editor, Ray Palmer, supposedly did a detailed story on Adam Warburg's discoveries. Okay, in like sort of 57 when it first started, I think. But it's claimed that uh, all the 
all the print, all the printing, but it says that basically the, the US government either bought, stole or destroyed every single copy of the magazine and even destroyed the printing plates at the press. So they say. Uh, so, like, you know, when governments do stuff like that, you always think, well, there's nothing to it. You know, like Gary McKinnon, when he's got into a secure bit of, you know, the US government and found some talk about off-world and extraterrestrial officers and whatnot. And so they freaked out about like, trying to extradite him and put him in prison forever. And you think, well, if, if it's nothing to it, and it's just some, you know, autistic guy that's managed to do a bit of light hacking, using a dial-up PC really slow, and then it's only got in because you didn't put a password in, in your administration. It's, you know what I mean? It's like, no, if there's nothing to it, why try and go down hard on people? You know, why go destroying copies of a magazine sort of thing? It's weird, man. You know, why censor things if there's nothing to what people are saying, right? Why censor them? Mm -hmm. You write yourself that. I've been asking myself that a lot recently. And I bet a lot of people have. But anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> this is... This is the thing. There's... You know, the Germans are on it. The Germans are on it. They were talking like... Um, they had... The German Nazis uh, base there. I mean, they all, they all say they've got maps and stuff, and they've got maps of like, um, yeah, I'll share screen again for the people of you. It's a, yeah, they've got maps of like um, what they call a, they've got they've got their own city down there, like New Berlin, New Berlin, you know. And in this in this map here, it shows a the German map of Agartha. And they say they're calling it. Um, this this map shows us for those that can view it. I say check the links if you want to see them. The main continent of this hemisphere, they're calling it Liberia, okay. And in the centre, and, and there's a is the Fera Islands, and below is the the city of uh, Shambhala, the, the city of the gods, calling it the city of the gods, right? So you got yeah, it's German stuff. They got they're naming an ocean. They got like yeah, you know these continent, these land masses are separated by an ocean there too. You know, connected to our ocean. You know, they're calling it like the the Valakarishja Ocean and, and you know, they've got like U boat bases marked on this map and shit. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like what got, you know, and above As Asgard on the sort of northeast they've got the Eschen Sea, you know, and Liberia. <laughs> they're calling this continent Liberia. That's where they they've got the Valakarisha Ocean and and Air and Mare, little uh, like a uh, kind of leaky bit in the middle. <laughs> uh, can, and there like two kind of land bridges connecting Chambala to Li uh, Liberia. And it's like, what? You know, because the monks like talk like it really, really exists and stuff. And it's like, you've got all these, these maps, you know, of <laughs> ways through to get into it and, and what the, the, uh, the contents are all mapped out like proper cartography and stuff so you know and I'm thinking City of the Gods we've heard that before City of the Gods and I think yeah like tunnels all over the world and uh, City of the Gods is a ancient site of Teotihuacan Central Mexico and that's what the Aztecs called it City of the Gods you know one of the great mysteries of the world plus the area of Central South America like I say it's uh, well known well known for uh, not only underground tunnels and there's un underworld mythology with the, the Aztec myths and legends that are well known for this. Uh, um, what's known as uh, Chicamostoc, the place of the seven caverns. In, in Mayan creation story, you know, they've got the underground kingdom of Zibalaba. That's, so that's, that's totally real, physical place from which humanity has emerged at the dawn of time. Caves and ancient tunnels are believed to be the gates of the mysterious subterranean underworld. Yeah, a nice little paragraph there from a, a blog on Chartered Runes. So yeah, I mean, of course there's a... Talking about ancient kind of epic cities lost to it. It's like, what about El Dorado? You know, I'm thinking this, uh, you know, the golden city and the golden, you know... <laughs> city of the gods kind of thing and then i'm thinking well you know el dorado it turns out that originally that that meant el hombre dorado 
So it's like the golden man. You know, and then it becomes El Rey Dorado. Golden King. And then over time, the term is used in the Spanish 16th century to describe a mythical tribal chief, Zippy, Zipper, of the uh, Musica people, an indigenous uh, people of Altiplano. And I think, uh, uh, okay, so in, in Colombia, they've got this initiation right where you, you, know, you cover yourself in gold dust and be submerged into Lake Guatavita. So legends surrounding El Dorado, you know, it's kind of changing the meaning a bit over time as it went from a man to a city to a kingdom and then finally an empire. But a king covering himself in gold dust I've got another notable inclusion there with the practices of Egypt, and that's reflected in the Stargate pop culture story, where there's a scene in the in the movie where Ra, son of God, city of the sun, gold, son of God, Ra, gold, the, the top metal in alchemy, and you know. And Ra in the Stargate film is doing the like, male Cleopatra thing, uh, you know, in the gold dust. And also, music of people. Could that even be a reference to the fabled um, continent of Mu? Or Lemuria? You know, there's a supposed continent lost to us in the ocean, came to like the Atlantis story, but then that was because of like finding, the, it was thought there might be a, you know, <laughs> Well, Lemuria, and there's a, well, Wikipedia says um, Lemuria or Lemuria is a hypothesized um, continent proposed in 1864 by zoologist Philip Skelter. Okay. So, and he's saying that um, it, uh, it could account for some stuff because they find uh, lemur fossils in Madagascar, in India, but not in Africa or in the Middle East. The thought there might be something that's kind of connected, connected the you know sort of two together. And it could be an ancestral home of mankind caused by the hypothesis that beyond it's beyond the scope of geology. So the you know it, you know is this a reference to that place, Lumeria, Liberia? You know, and Wikipedia says uh, that at least uh, Lumeria and Mu. I thought Mu might be some ancient underground city in the Gobi Desert. I thought I heard it some about that, but I think this is talking Wikipedia release. They're saying the mainstream stuff saying, yeah, Lemuria Mu, just you know, Mu short of Lemuria, sort of same thing, you know. But then that guy, but then you know, it connects the brain, you connect the dots. It gets me wondering, I wonder if any of you listeners remember the 90s rave outfit KLF. Well, it's probably 80s, actually, probably 80s and 90s, but yeah, KLF. Remember KLF? They had a song, um a song Justified and Ancient featuring country singer uh, um songwriter da- Tammy Wynette. Okay. So, you know, you've got Lost Civilizations, Underground, Legends, you know, all this pop culture stuff. And, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And we do have huge spaces underneath the Earth's crust. So, I mean, what's, what's going on here? And we do, say, we do have... Um, you know, tunnels and civilizations buried in, in, in Turkey. There's a there's an underground city. I think it's into a mountain as well. It's like it's cut into a mountain and goes down. You know, uh, it's in in Turkey, it's the it's called the uh, Derinkuyu underground city, and it's it's massive. It could host twenty thousand people. You get your livestock in there and just be in there. And it's wicked. You want to look, check it out. It's acoustic as well. It's all acoustic. They've got what looks like it might be a central speaking chamber kind of priestly place kind of thing. Like a religious bit kind of near the middle. And the way it's kind of cut and where that's positioned, it, you can hear it. When you speak in that room, you can hear it everywhere in the whole place. It's crazy, man. <laughs> uh, yeah. And there's, I mean, can you lose? I've lost cities and cities that's lost to us. Well, you know, is it? City, that underground city there, underground cities can happen. Machu Picchu was a city on the top of a mountain, abandoned in 1572 and then forgotten about. You know, so it's like, well, you know, yeah, <laughs> you can lose a whole city and a whole civilization. Do you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, this is one of them, isn't it? So, I mean, there's also like, um, there's also controversial evidence that, uh, Past decades, it says in the rainforest, right? You know, up the, up the Amazon, yeah. And people went there, same sort of time, like um, fifteen, you know, mid sixteenth century, uh, up the Amazon. 
Europeans go, uh, document all these people in great cities, go back a few decades later, none of it there. I think, what's going on? Must be mythical, but no. No, some of the, the sort of European diseases of, you know, wiped them out or whatever, and uh, the jungle over a few decades has um, taken over the stone structures and all the, the wooden structures and stuff that they're supposed to have had on top, connecting the treetops together, you know, keep them off the jungle floor. It's uh, That's all going to, you know, fall down and rot away over time for the decades and then no trace of them anymore. Jungle reclaims everything, you know, and say so there's a... Um, there's evidence of the uh, past decades of the Amazon rainforest has once home to a, a large, uh, large populations of people. Besides well-known empires of the Inca, the predecessors to Hauri, millions of people once lived in the rainforest and shaped the environment to suit their own needs. Okay, and there is terra preta comes from there, which is an engineered soil that's that is the most fertile soil in the world. Because it was often argued that the soil in the rainforest isn't fertile enough for large scale agriculture but it absolutely turns out it is because somebody's literally engineered soil recipes to make this microbiological process take place in the soil where it's super fertile and essentially grows so much every year so you know yeah <laughs> this civilization can get lost or become lost to us we just don't know it can be epic you know what i'm saying so it's like you know, so I'll put the links in the description, but I mean, that could be a whole show on its own, I suppose. But yeah, they can become lost to our memory and then seem mythical, you know? And so it's a bit like, um, <laughs> we've got to, we have to be able to perceive things and think outside of the box and just look at things, trying to look at things objectively and go where the information and the evidence leads. Because otherwise we're not going to be able to see stuff because of our biases and just refuses to accept things. You know, it's like uh, Dr. Richard Alamena, Doc Ram, often says, I, remember, I like this quote from him, he says that it's not like a case of, because your psychology and your belief kind of makes your, your reality what you actually physically see, isn't it? Right, the concepts of what you've got. So he sort of says it like, it, it's not, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it. It's more like, I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't have believed it. And much, indeed, much like the conquistadors, talking about Spain and Central Americas and stuff, the conquistadors, when, 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 they, when they were charged to go and do conquest in the Americas by Spain, they in fact did write about a lot, most of the locals couldn't see the ships because, you know, and I'm thinking perhaps that's because they had no concept to go sailing. So, you know, big massive sailing ships, like square cities on the wall top that you float across the ocean, it's just too alien concept to be visible and they wrote about that, that sort of concept so you know it's crazy but then there's, a, there's another account talking about bear in mind the Norwegian sailor this doctor saying that you know this Norwegian sailor or this Norwegian guy ended up going to this place you know in the, the book The Hollow Earth well, there's another book, The Smoky God. Bear in mind, it's talking him and his friend went to go and travel north and they saw this mountain. Well, there's a book called The Smoky God. It's supposed to be a biography of a Norwegian sailor called um, Olaf Jensen. Okay. Now, uh, the author is uh, William, William Emerson. He, he was charged with the task of chronicling this guy's, like, dying Norwegian guy's story. Okay, and he's giving me his crew maps and exclaims to him, oh, I'll leave this in your hands. If you can, if I can have your promise, you'll sort of give it to the world and I shall die happy, sort of thing. Is it, you know, because it's like, because this guy, man, oh, he had a really hard time. People don't believe in him. You know, he had a really, a real tough time. And he's basically saying, you know, there's no chance you'll suffer the same fate as me. They're not going to put you in irons. They're not going to confine you to a madhouse for telling your story because it's not your story, it's my story. So, you know, it says, and thank the, the gods and Odin and Thor, if you are able to tell my story, then I'll go to my grave happy sort of thing. Because the disbelievers won't be able to persecute you. And, you know, because he, he suffered, man. Uh, his own family got him locked up and stuff and thought he was nuts and, you know, whatever. But, yeah. So, I mean, so this, <laughs> so this Olaf Jensen, he really wants his story told, okay. So he talks about how in the Arctic Circle of Silence is land of glaciers of cold waters. So you got you, you went up there basically, and 
it's, it's saying there's all kind of spectacles up there and it says that um his marvelous speculations are indulged in concerning the earth's center of gravity all right and the cradle of the tides where the whales have their nurseries where magnetic needles go mad where the uh, aurora borealis illuminates the night and where the brave and courageous spirits of every generation dare to venture and explore define the dangers of the quote farthest north all right uh, famous russian channeler nicholas Roig, who channeled supposedly ascended master elmora claimed that lasha the capital of tibet was uh, connected by a tunnel to the inner earth which took it to shambhala okay and it was guarded by llamas who were sworn to secrecy and similar tunnels like they were supposed to be under um, giza so like same as the german maps you know so also interesting here as well that uh, Christopher Columbus, when he was, his patrons are paying for him to go and do some and explore things and that, and he said to them, is that he discovered uh, the ascent uh, to the ancient gate of the long lost Garden of Eden. He says he felt his ship smoothly rising towards the sky. You're thinking, what? What's, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he says, uh, I do not suppose the earthly paradise which I've described as being a uh, form, he says, it says it's in the form of a stalk and pier, the approach to it from the distance must be a constant and gradual ascent. Must be a constant and gradual ascent. It kind of like a pier and then a stalk. And I'm thinking, is it? It's talking like like a river opening, going into a cavern kind of thing. And it said no one could ever reach the top. I think it. I think also that the water described may proceed from it, like those. Like the Norwegian guy, the doctor said Norwegian guy was talking like it's like the the ocean is coming out of this cavern. It's a, it's turned out to be a big canyon coming out of this mountain. It's a very similar description, and he says um, and he says it comes out and forms a lake, which uh, yeah, it's it's a very similar description. And he says I've no I, I've no doubt I can pass the equatorial after reaching the highest point of which I've spoken. And should find much milder temperatures and variations in the stars. So he's talking about it being warmer up there, and crossing the equatorial. I'm, it's almost like I'm thinking he's, he's talking about that, the, the flipping point sort of thing between. Um, like if you look at the map again, the flipping point where it's like a conveyor belt where you're going to the underside of it. I think it's like he's talking about the bit where the gravity. Where you've got to turn over so it's like you'd, be, you'd look like you're rising towards the sky where your boat would really be dropping down turning over but it'd look like it was going up towards the sky but then that sky is the inside of this thing do you know what i mean so this it's just i don't know it's hard to imagine it's hard to imagine but i mean it's, it's crazy the way he describes this stuff and it's like you know i'm thinking if even christopher columbus is talking about it so it's like well <laughs> you know i'm just going to read a little passage from from oh, from this book um oh sorry into what the book was called is it's restaurant in columbus this is called paradise found creative uh, creative human race at the north pole okay thinking what the hell so it's basically talking about how you, know, you should find much milder temperatures and whatnot. And it's, it's talking like it's a, an ascent to heaven, uh, into the dragon's mouth. North is, you know, it's, it's, it's basically sort of coming up with the same description. So I, I definitely check this out, man. This, uh, this book, uh, I found a, a link to, to sort of be able to read pictures of it free in like kind of National Archive type thing. So I'll, uh, yeah, definitely check this out. It's in some Canadian archive. But you can you can read the page pictures of the pages yourself man it's crazy i want to read this bit it's on page four and five but yeah anyway moving on there's uh so after columbus i mean we've also got a 12th century saxon canon hugo de saint victor writer on a mythical mythology in a, the the situ terrarium he writes a uh, paradise is a spot in the orient that's what he reckons all kinds of wood and stuff and trees there contains life it's neither cold nor hot, a perpetually 
um, equatable temperature. It contains a, a fountain which flow uh, the four great rivers. In the 13th century poem by uh, Gautier de Mats, he describes a terrestrial paradise as situated in an unapproachable region of Asia. All right. Surrounded by flames and guarded at the gate by an armed angel. That's what he's saying there. And then in uh, 1322, Sir John de Maldeville made a pilgrimage to the east. And uh, from his travels, describes a marvellous kingdom, uh, Prester John. And beyond, he says, uh, beyond the land of the isles, the deserts of Prester John's lordship. And going straight towards the east, men find nothing but mountains and great rocks. And there is a dark region where no may see neither day or by night that's you know and it says that the desert is kind of darkness lasts from this coast all the way into the treasure of paradise where adam and eve were put to, uh, towards this the east is the beginning of the world talking like into the sun like you know rises in the east sets in the west sort of talking like that right they're saying it's the highest place on earth and then it touches the circle of the moon it is enclosed by a wall. The wall is covered, you know, they're talking about this wall that's covered by moss and it's made from natural stone and stretches from north all the way to south. So I don't know what they've come across in the east, you know. But I think 13th century, but anyway, 14th century talks, uh, uh, talks of uh, Prince Eric from Icelandic saga where uh, he goes to Constantinople with a friend and you know, checks this stuff too. In the Indian epic, the Ramayana, Bhagavad Gita, two most famous uh, Indian texts, uh, Ramayana tells of uh, a great avatar, Rama, and the Bhagavad Gita tells of Krishna and Rama describing uh, the emissary of Agatha, okay, who arrived on an air vehicle. So, in both Buddhism and Hinduism, they're both separately referring to Agatha. Okay, straight up talking about it. Famed channeler Ed Casey, in a March 1935, he referred to uh, a city under the sands, the Gobi Desert, and that's where I got that idea from. And, in, and, and he called it a uh, city of gold. Do you know what I mean? It's like this, it's almost like these things are uh, sort of mixed in together, you know? And it's, so it lives, the ruler lives in an esteemed temple. Uh, so in case it's psychic and channel you know so maybe he's making up maybe he's not but it's interesting there's a few sources kind of saying the same thing from different points in time all over the place different people i don't know so like i say el dorado the the golden one the city uh, the king of the world and buddhism you know we're talking this stuff talking about the lama giving them the messages for us we've seen uh, the german military historically even during the fall of the First World War, just check in. That's what the whole Indiana Jones thing is. The old Indiana Jones thing is about Germans going all over looking for artifacts, trying to um, create get evidence of Aryans and Ubermen, and try and create uh, Ubermen in in a you know the Nazi villain Red Skull is transformed by the Tesseract in a Captain Marvel, to, you know, creating Supermen and stuff, and that was a a powerful artifact from another world called Asgard. Well, that's what, that's what the Nazis were calling, you know, the inside of this place, Asgard. And you know, Nazi maps are called New Berlin is in the land of Asgard, one of the continents of the inside Earth. Okay, so it's like, you know, so going back in, I'm with a story of the Smoky Mountain. It says that, okay, Olaf was 19 when he went off on this epic journey with his dad. And, um, and they got basically, they got hit by a big storm, big blizzard, big really snowy storm, lost a load of water, lost tons of the food. But they carried on, um, you know, just trying to stay stay positive. And uh, he, he was talking about, um, he really believes in like, Odin and Thor, and he's very traditional, his father was. And he explained how uh, northwards is the land more beautiful than mortal men can, can ever know. He really believed in this place, and it's like trying to take his son there. He said it was inhabited by the chosen, this special other place, and it's, that's kind of reminds me a bit of again pop culture, Marvel Agents of Shield. They've got these people known as the Inhumans, where they're put through this this process that kind of 
turns into stone and they either die or become like you know like x-men mutants kind of thing it's sort of powers the special and the chosen so you know becoming something a bit more kind of thing it changes them a lot you know but anyway going on back home so he's talking about going up there and um, this instead of cold as anticipated it was warmer and more pleasant right than it had been on uh, Norway when it was there before on the north coast six weeks before so it's got warmer after six weeks of sailing going further and further north as it travelled further north according to Olev's father there was hit say by this uh, big snowstorm mashed them all up but kept to it you know and um and <laughs> And, it, and he's, you know, he was saying uh, uh, his, dad, his dad stayed really positive about it all. Do you know what I mean? Just a real hero sort of thing. And uh, keeping his chin up. And then, uh, but there was panicking about all the water being washed over. But then, uh, after a bit, they, they realised that that the water that they were travelling in, sailing through, was fresh. They couldn't believe it. They figured that out. So it's like, oh my God, it's the gods have saved us, you know, sort of thing. So, so I mean, yeah. So they got fresh water out of the sea, which is a bit strange, you know. And and icebergs are kind of like fresh water too. I think where are they coming from, you know. So they kept saying, and then his, and then his, his dad woke him up at one point, and he says that his dad woke him up to point the sun out and say, "Oh look, there's a false sun," you know, like a mirage, and he's heard of these. But he says this, you know, this so-called false sun. It says like it was still there. And they say he kind of stayed there for a bit and was expecting it to disappear, but it didn't. So he said it was like a, a dull red false sun, but it did not pass away for several hours. Right. And they were... So uh, while we were unconscious of it emitting rays of light, still there was no time thereafter as we could not sweep the horizon in front of the lo location uh, locale to locate the illumination of the so-called false sun period of 12 hours out of uh, 24 so it's it says uh, clouds and mists at times would almost but never entirely hide its location gradually it seemed to climb higher in the horizon of an uncertain purple sky as we advanced it could hardly be said to resemble the sun except in its circular shape and when not obscured clouds by the clouds oceans or mist it had a hazy red bronzed appearance which would change to a white like luminous cloud as if reflecting some greater light beyond we finally agreed in our discussion of this smoky furnace colored sun that whatever the cause of the phenomenon it was not a reflection of our sun but a planet of some sort in reality and thought, well, that's that's a bit strange, man. It's like the thing, the seeing a planet, you know. And then this, the, so basically, the sea land. Did you eventually get to land? Find some nuts on there, eat some nuts, you know. And I calculated how long they said they was. They thought they'd been going for about five months. So four, four and a half to seven miles an hour is the average speed. Calculate at top speed, seven miles an hour. If they sail for twelve hours a day, every day. It goes 2,450 miles at the slowest wind speed, sailing 12 hours a day. They'd go 1,475 miles, so 1,500 1, to 2,500 miles roughly. So that ties in with as far as Admiral Bird needed to go to go and see some of this stuff. So I don't know where he flew from, but Norway would be a good, Scandinavia would be the most obvious place to go in through the North Pole. But anyway, yeah. Or, or Canada, you know, or Canada, you know, yeah, whatever. So, you know, it's about the distance seems about right. If there was, I don't know, I don't know. But it says, yeah, the, it says, but they go in there. They get, so they come into this like mouth, or looks like a massive river, just like the other guys discovered. That's why I call it the Smoky Mountain, because it's like and this smoky god. It's like they go into this same thing. This sort of like you get to this certain point, and it's like almost like a river opens up and you go in go through this place and it's these cabins uh, these big canyons and that and you know you got in there and it's like they find they meet these people in these ships they're massive you know and 
and these people the huge gliding ships coming down the river towards them he says that aboard the ship was singing singing one mighty chorus echoing from bank to bank sounded like thousands of voices instead of filling the whole universe with a quivering melody okay and basically what it is is people on a boat there's people on a boat and they're really big just like giants you know it says there's six men of gigantic stature uh row our little fishing boat salute it says uh they spoke a strange language right and you know the guys immense boats they're lower some guys down <laughs> it says uh they lowered six men out of gigantic structure and rode and rode to our little fishing sloop <laughs> it's like uh, these guys are huge but it says we're not on front end they talked a great deal amongst themselves spoke a strange language um as if and there was getting the impression they thought there was you know there's a bit of a strange discovery and when they spied the uh, compass which looked like they'd, uh, they'd screwed that to the uh, to the wood to the cross beam so they didn't lose that uh in the storm but yeah they was finding the compass really really they was really interested in the compass you know and they went to go and meet um this this priest who's you know says what do you want to do do you want to try and get back or walk I mean, it might be not possible to get back and they're asking questions where they come from and stuff and it looks as if it's that the poles so what they're saying is from the story and description the poles gather at like the coldest spots but once you get more towards the inside it gets a warmer climate just like ours you know get close to the equator it gets warmer and warmer because they're supposed to have this kind of central sun whatever it is so ice so big pack ice stuff does form around the north pole and would form around and you know would form around the south pole but it's already a continent there so you've got that's cold still right so it looks like through the North Pole, they've had to decide to get the way they get out. They have to navigate in, in you know, like um, like doing the cannonball run type thing, getting in between um, massive icebergs and stuff that are just gigantic. So, I mean, it's really, it's really crazy stuff. It's really, really crazy. You know, I know how it sounds. I really do. I know, I know how this crazy stuff sounds. But the thing is, there's a few different accounts of this of people actually going there yeah let's have a look at yeah and you know it's a couple of nice little pictures of people viewing this big storm lock in the in the book of smoky mountain that's the a big depiction of the the red uh, sun looking thing there's these are the men that have found them on the boat and a quick little picture of meeting the uh, the wise priest who's a bit taller than the rest of them seemed really nice spoke with him for two hours you know pictures of animals but yeah so they managed to get their way back because like they knew that you know it's his, his only son and his, his mum would be worried and stuff and trying to get back but you know on his way back is uh they're getting between icebergs and stuff you know massive and one of them uh, flipped up snapped caught the underside of the boat flipped him over left him stuck on an iceberg the boat on his side his dad gone you know what i mean kept walking round and round this iceberg looking to try and find his dad terrified to stop looking like admitting defeat you know his 19 year old kid you know, cause his, look, his dad gets killed. His dad disappears after that. You know, these iceberg, massive icebergs hit the boat. Come on, you know, snap and knock it up in the air. You know, he was screwed. But according to the story, uh, the smoky god story, that Olaf, Olaf Jensen, he's, uh, yeah, he was really, really lucky that um, it, someone had seen him. Some whalers had seen him. Because it had probably because of him walking around and around had spotted him and they wanted to know what he was doing. And this that and the other and it's it was just saying well you know <laughs> he tried to tell them the truth you know about these these giants and the boats that had these big spinning discs on either side like they sound like gyroscopes and some conversation about uh, gravity keeps it stops it's like a big monorail took them on a monorail to go and see this uh, priest guy and yeah with these big wheels spinning either side and it was explaining to do something to do with gravity and it sounded a little bit, a little bit like gyroscopes so you know i mean did wonder about it just it sounds kind of convincing to me but i don't know it's just it's a strange one so i said I check this stuff out I don't, I don't always say it but I, I mean it i really mean it go and check this stuff out because there's some some crazy stuff about this and say it's coming from hinduism coming from buddhism that's just doing stuff down there you're not allowed to fly over the poles there's loads of crazy stuff going off in antarctica 
Yeah, you can easily lose a civilization. Gobekli Tepe, that was another show. Karahan Tepe, sister of Gobekli, did a show on that. Gobekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe, they're massive ancient cities, oldest cities that we know of now, oldest megaliths we know of now. And that was intentionally buried. So <laughs> we don't even need disasters and forgetting stuff. And people, you know, people sometimes bury whole cities, you know? So, I mean, go, like I say, go and, go and check this stuff out. Go and check this stuff out, because I know, I know it's a bit crazy, but this, you've got to go where it leads. And we've got to speculate a lot on this, but, you know, this popping up in pop culture, uh, Skull Island, Kong, you know, giving an explanation as to where things like Godzilla comes from and the massive and King Kong's massive because it comes from an inner earth place. You know, they, they've explored it. It's been explored, this stuff. So there might just be something to this. Because I think, to be honest, you you know, if you've been listening, you know me, me be on ad. By this point, what's on the TV and the news and stuff, as far as I'm concerned, that's the big massive fairy tale, you know. And like I say, the box saga with the Finnish family holding, you know, people originally come from the North Pole, they're saying, when the Earth one tilted, this, that, and the other, and it's, you know, it's rings that are established, this spread civilization out, then spread another one, ring coming out of there and another ring coming out of there. Maybe we're just the outer ring. And on, and on the outside environment, you can't grow as big, you know? Because it's talking inside there. It's a different kind of environment. Things are thriving, growing really large. It's more electrically charged air in there, you know? So who knows? What do you think? Have a, have a th think about what you think. Yeah, say any comments. You know, let me know what you think. And, yeah, just look into this stuff. And um, hopefully, if anything, just gets the, the cogs turning in your head, give you some food for thought. And that's that's the main thing. So just get, get your brain thinking, keep it exercised. And like I say, I just... Uh, that's that's my whole point, really. Explore these these strange things and just see if there's something to some of this stuff. Because I know being lied to about a lot of stuff that I can prove. It's all about the stuff that I don't know about, you know? So... Uh, that's the that's the end of the show folks might do another one on this so it's just a big topic but that's the hollow earth show exile minds podcast amelia martin quick look into ag Hartel and the inner world so might do another show on this but we'll see but thanks for tuning in to the exile minds podcast and uh you take care of yourself and uh keep thinking keep looking keep reading keep sharing and you take it easy look after yourself see you next time